Asset Radio. You're listening to The Edge. Everything bass fishing coming to you worldwide from MegaWare Kill Guard Studios. Bass Edge Radio is back. Y'all, we're going to have another great episode. The March 15th episode number 348. Aaron, we are moving in close to 350 episodes. Crazy. Crazy times. Who would have thought, Kurt, when we started this thing that neither of us really knew what a podcast was, that we would still be here, you know, three almost 350 episodes later. But, uh, hey, it's good to be in the chair on the mic with you and um, just making sure not to forget to remind you to wear your green uh, stuff, I guess. Yeah. For the upcoming St. Patty's Day in a couple days. Bottoms up. You got your green juice, whatever juice you choose to drink. I've got mine set, ready to go. Cheers. Bottoms up. Always the latter half of March. A lot, lot of things to celebrate besides St. Patrick's Day, but uh, warm weather, uh, excitement in the spring, and um, tournament bass fishing on the hill, dude. So many events going on. Love it. Yes, it's nice to know that uh, changing weather does not involve, hopefully, any sustaining, uh, you know, snowfall uh, at this point in time. <laughs> I like I like the new music of the birds and some of that. So uh, good times. It's always a, a fun time in the sport of fishing when we hit these times. But speaking of fun times, that's the uh, times that we've had with MegaWare Keelguard over the years. And, of course, want to remind everybody Bass Edge is 100% presented by MegaWare Keel Guard, first do-it-yourself keel protector, Flex Step, Skag Guard, the uh, Scuff Buster, Kurt, and just on and on the list goes. But even, even for the uh, crappie folk out there, we got the Pontoon Guard, got to protect the yes, size sir. of the sponsors. That's right. Guards. That's right. All kinds of great stuff. Man. Be sure and visit them at uh, keelguard.com. I got to mention, too. Really noticed this year, got those battery guards in. And, you know, the battery guard is one of those things, Aaron, that you don't see. You know, everything else you see all the time. You see your your keel guard. You see your flex step. You see your skeg pro. You know, all these yeah, it's things. it's kind of like a mushroom. It never gets the love, you know? Yeah. Dude, it does not get the love that it deserves. But I got to tell you, my batteries have been tapping me on the shoulder, thanking me after every rough run this year so uh man i i I know that it's doing uh, a lot of good to keep my batteries protected and uh useful for a long period of time no failures so far and uh, don't anticipate any because i got a battery guard on the bottom of those bad boys so don't forget about that to be a great accessory for your boat as well we move on aaron to the pro tip we got a protect the harvest.com tackle tip y'all stay tuned we got a great episode just kicking off here march 15th 2021 be right back this episode protect the harvest.com tackle tip with bass elite series pro patrick walter you know during the springtime on a, your texas rig and say your wacky worm weight size is a critical factor you know, during the pre-spawn, I usually throw a heavier weight. When I'm throwing an eco rig and a Texas rig, I'll say throw a half ounce or a three-eighths, whether I'm pitching around. And as the spring progresses into the spawn, that's when I start to dwindle my weight size down, where I'll basically, on a wacky worm, I'll go completely weightless. And on a Texas rig, I'm going from a three-eighths to an eighth ounce to an almost weightless Texas rig. You know, as the spawn really kicks in full gear, the more weightless baits really tend to shine. You know, it's less intrusive. You had to really pick the areas apart. So as the spring progresses, so your weight sizes should drop. And then as the post spawn comes back up, you can jack the weights back up. So always play with those weights a little bit and uh, you can never go too light. Great tip, Patrick, brought to you by protecttheharvest.com. First by land and now by sea. For years, Lucas Oil has been a staple in high-performance vehicles on both the road and track. Now, from the makers of Lucas Oil comes Lucas Marine products, specifically engineered for marine applications. Protect and lubricate your marine inboard, outboard, or high-performance boat with Lucas Marine Engine Oil or Lucas Synthetic-Based Oil. Learn more about the complete line of Lucas Oil and marine products. Visit lucasoil.com. 
Nitro Performance Bass Boats. Get pro-level performance with the Nitro Z18, the official boat of Major League Fishing. The Z18, with its nimble handling and versatility, sports many of the features in the larger boats in the line, like a Guardian Live Well, a heavily insulated cooler, dual 8-foot rod storage, and our smooth and fast NVT hull. Every Nitro boat is laid out to do one thing very well, catch fish. Enormous front decks up to 45 square feet on the Z21 allow maximum mobility when battling unruly bass and feature low-profile gunnels for ease of skipping, pitching, flipping, or landing fish. Nitro Performance Bass Boats, pure fishing machines. So, Kurt, you like trivia. I do. And, um, you know, the last trivia question I asked you a few episodes ago obviously made it too easy. So I'm going to try and turn up the difficulty <laughs> a little bit. You know, you're now to level two. Let me close my eyes. Yes. Let me, let me do, visualize. Visualize. Yes, correct. So th- this is a question, and you have to name the answer of what has, what possesses, what, you know, features, however you want to say this without trying to give you uh, any more clues. But I'm looking for what actually has – from tackle reviews to electronics, okay, uh-huh. kayaking to guiding, sponsorship tips to trailer care, and goes from Florida to Wisconsin. Okay, this is easy because I actually have this issue on the coffee table right behind me. Well, that's and cheating. That is Bass Angler Magazine. Yeah, that's cheating. Mark told me I got it before you did, so I was actually <laughs> thought I was – you know, throwing no. you an actual curveball this time, but no. obviously that's not the case. Yeah, Bass Angler Magazine. I get every every issue that has all that great stuff, especially this 2021 spring issue. All right. Well, I yeah. Now now my feelings are hurt because I thought you know Mark Lassane, who obviously friend of Bass Edge and and the <laughs> founder of that, I, I thought I was on some kind of special mailing list where I got my issue before you did, but obviously that's <laughs> not the case. So no, it's a it's a loaded issue that is for sure. Don't with- forget that I'm a bass junkie. I read every. Everything. So Bass Angler Magazine is always part of my reading repertoire. Yeah, certainly. Good stuff in there. I mean, you know, just a, a loaded issue with, you know, Timmy Horton cranking Glenn Walker explaining kind of, uh, you know, the fishing rip rap, Brandon Lester, Bill Lowen, Jordan Lee. I mean, anyway, it's just, uh, yeah, if they, you don't they have do a it, great job, yeah. they do a great job. Love the episodes from BAM. Yes. Bass Correct. So if you don't have it, be sure and check them out. Kurt, I do want to transition into all of these uh, crazy tournaments that's been going on. Is that kind of a precursor of what we might be expecting on future guests? I think April is going to be fire, dude. So many tournaments going on. It's hard to catch up with everyone because they go right from one event to the next and it's wild. But uh, recently you got the Elite Series event in Tennessee. You've got the uh, Red Crest, the championship from MLF just you know concluded a couple of weeks ago. You've got the Pro Circuit event just now completed on Lewis Smith Lake. So we're going to catch up with all, maybe not all, but several of those anglers for the April. So y'all stay tuned. You know, we're going to keep bringing some of the best in the industry. And you know, we got one today, you know, uh, a guy that's making some headway in the industry that uh, we're, we're going to be stoked to talk to and kind of introduce Bass Edge Nation too, and and get to know him ourselves. So I'm I'm excited about today's Lucas Oil Angler Spotlight. Man, it's just a uh, typical springtime in the world of bass fishing. Can't get enough. Don't want to get enough, and want to keep loading it up. Man, love this stuff. So Bass Edge Nation, y'all stay tuned. We're gonna get into our feature segment, the Lucas Oil Angler Spotlight. Stay tuned. It's gonna start right after this message. This is BASS Elite Angler John Cruz. This is MLF BPT Pro Jacob Wheeler. This is BASS Elite Series Pro Brandon Polony. It's me, FLW Pro Matt Becker. This is BPT MLF Pro Angler Mike Iconelli. Hang on, Bass Edge Radio. We'll be right back. You know the importance of protecting your investments. So why use anything else other than the original and toughest DIY keel protector for your boat? MegaWare Keel Guard. Grinding sand, abrasive rocks, and concrete ramps are no match for our exclusive contoured edge and patented technology. MegaWare Keel Guard keel protectors are made tough and made to stick. Their do-it-yourself installation takes less than an hour, providing the longest-lasting, most dependable keel protection for your boat. Guaranteed for life. Developed specifically by boat builders, offering the best keel protection in the industry. 
Also from MegaWare Keel Guard, Skeg Guard, Flex Step Pro, and Pontoon Guard. So give your boat the performance edge. Put on the protection the pros pick. MegaWare Keel Guard. Aaron, we got us a Bass Edge rookie in the house today. I met this angler last year on his way to a top five finish, the Harris Chain of Lakes at the MLF Pro Circuit. Then he strapped a BFL victory into his belt last year during the summertime. And I'm not sure if he ever goes home. He's been on the road a lot since he took the plunge into the national fishing scene. But super stoked to have on the show today, Kyle Gellis. Kyle Thanks for being on the podcast, and welcome to Bass Edge Radio. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Well, Kyle, uh, I'm excited to have you on here. But first, I want to get, I guess, kind of the full skinny on the next Idaho prodigy. And I'm sure it doesn't take you very long to guess who the other one was that we had uh, way back when. But Idaho's just not the metropolis of bass fishing that you would compare to like a Texas or a Florida. So tell us some of your background and the path to bassing on the national level. Yeah, that's kind of funny you'd bring up Brandon because that's like the first thing anyone ever asked me when I'm <laughs> traveling. They find out I'm from Idaho, they like, do you know Brandon? I was like, well, yeah, I know of him. You know, he's <laughs> right. kind of famous. But yeah, my background in Idaho is pretty much just that. You know, it's my past has been kind of all over the place. And a lot of that has to do with just my life in general. I kind of got into competitive bass fishing late in my life, you know, just right after high school when I was starting college. And so really my fishing schedule was kind of oriented around you know my finals my test schedule you know I was working full-time and so really my path just veered all over the place but you know I wanted to spend as much time as I could on the water because I love it you know I there's nothing I enjoy more and that's why I'm out here is because I love competitive bass fishing so I took every opportunity to compete whether it was at you know, the TBF level, Bass Nation events, clubs, state open, you know, it just really started from the beginning at a club level and just worked its way up to where we are today, where we're traveling across the country and chasing fish. And that's very cool. So let me say, a lot of kids nowadays go to college just for the bass fishing, <laughs> right? And it, it sounds like you were a little bit after that. You went to college for an education. Then the bass fishing became a central focus after all that happened because you were scheduling bass fishing around finals. And a lot of people schedule finals around bass fishing nowadays. So where did yeah. you go to school and were you able to compete collegiately in bass fishing or, or how was that process for you? So I went to Idaho state university and like you said idaho we're known more for you know our famous trout fishing um than we are competitive bass fishing and so really i think boise state at the time was the only place that had a college fishing team and it was just barely kind of starting to get going when i was in college and there was the opportunity to start my own club you know at idaho state at the time but I really didn't know much about it. And it was just really starting to take off. You know, it wasn't as big as it is now, you know, by any means. And, you know, really, I just went to college, focused on that. You know, I worked full time and just spent as much time fishing as I could around life. So I didn't get to compete at that college level, which I truly wish I could almost go back to college just so I could experience it because it seems like a pretty awesome program. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat, man. I wish they had college fishing when I was in school, and uh, I, it wasn't even a blip on the radar back then. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I would have graduated if they had college fishing, though. That'd be the problem, so. Right. Yeah, I hear that, man. I saw through your MLF profile, you spent a lot of time fishing the Western Division, obviously, of the Toyota Series, and you, you kind of came up. I don't know if it's, I would say nowadays, kind of a traditional upbringing through the system. You know, you, you started out at a co-angler level, then kind of transferred into the uh, boater side or the pro side and um, started to have some end ways and, and really kind of get some experience in a region of the country. But then you made a jump with, I would say, without a ton of experience into the national level. Really wanted to dive in and see what prompted you to make that move and how your experience has been up to this point well really you know while i was going to school and you know fishing all that time i knew i wanted to fish professionally somehow some way i didn't know 
what that path looked like. Um, I knew really the only chance to make a major circuit would be through the West Coast Toyota Series, what they call it now. I think it was the rail back, you know, way back when, when I was right. fishing in college. But really, the, you know, the qualifier system out West, you know, that was really the only option for, you know, a West Coast guy to qualify for MLS because, you know, Bassmaster, you know, they never hold any opens over there on the West Coast. And so, right. um, like I said, the years I fished the Toyota Series, they're kind of scattered, you know, and most of that was because of my life situation, whether I was going to school or working, you know, I'd start out as a co-angler fishing one or two here and there, wherever I could fit them in my schedule to eventually, I think a couple of years I fished as a co-angler, the full circuit, just trying to learn more and grow as an individual, as an angler. And then, then I started doing them as a boater. And a lot of times, you know, certain years with my vacation at work and stuff, I could only fish one or two of them and, you know, not a full series. And then finally I saved up enough time, enough money that, you know, the year before I came out here on the pro circuit, I was able to fish a full division and, you know, really didn't have a standout season, but I got the invite and I just knew, you know, with my personal situation, I had some money saved up that I could fund myself through the first year. And the time was now, if it was ever going to be any, you know, for me, I don't have any kids. I don't really have any family back home tying me down or obligations that way, you know, that I really had to worry about. So I was pretty much free to do what I wanted. And I just, you know, couldn't say no to the opportunity to come out here and fish some of these places I'd only ever read about or seen on TV. So, well, hats off to you, Kyle, for charting that course. And, you know, my opinion is that collegiate athletes, like when you were going through that, that's some of the most difficult, I think, times to, to be able to juggle your studies, keep your grades up, the demands of, of just college, but also then trying to be your own travel coordinator, come up with enough money to stay out there, you know, and do what you do, not to mention try to stay competitive, you know, and kind of along that same line, I guess, you just barely missed kind of the championship last year, but gained an immense amount of experience. What do you define as a success for you moving through 2021? Well, definitely, you know, the championship is on my radar this year. I'll be pretty sad if I don't make it. I was sad last year and not because of the fact that I didn't make it, but because throughout the season, there were key moments, you know, whether you want to call them rookie mistakes, just not executing, you know, not making the right decisions at the right time that really cost me the opportunity of making that championship. So um, really coming into this season, I'm really focused on you know, execution and just making that championship. And I'm also fishing a Toyota series, you know, the, the Southern Toyota series here in Florida. And so really making that championship as well is going to define whether or not this year is successful. Man, talking a little bit before the interview got started, you mentioned um, being gone from home. I talked about, you know, getting home after the last few events and, and then getting back out on the road. And uh, you're just a straight roadie right now, right? So you said you might get back home in October, which which I, I find awesome, actually. And um, when you move through this process and are striving for, for these goals that you set for yourself, I mean, it's difficult for a lot of people to understand the sacrifice that it takes or, or the passion, really, I guess, that it takes to really just plunge yourself into this. Is it scary? Tell me your thought process yeah. of of just like your heart, what your heart said and, and why it was time, not necessarily your specific circumstance. Well, I guess it is kind of your specific circumstance, but but how that whole process yeah, just yeah. leads to fulfillment of life, I guess. Yeah. And I think that process is going to be, you know, different for everyone. You know, their path is going to be different from mine, but really, yeah, it's scary, dude. I mean, it's the most terrifying thing I think I've ever done in my life, you know, and it was more so last year being my rookie year. And to be honest, you know, I went to Sam Raver in pre-practice, had an okay pre-practice, and then I bombed at the event. And when you're driving from that event to another one, you're like, what am I doing? You, you know what I mean? I just crashed and burned big time. And so, you know, the fear sets in. But I think at that point, you really find out what you're made of. And like I said, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I didn't know how or why or when it was going to happen for me, but this was my one chance to make it happen. And you just get that feeling that it's time to do it. And when you get that feeling, you got to take your opportunity or else. I think you're going to regret it in life, you know? So I'm either going to make it and love what I do every day, you know, fishing competitively, or I'm going to be able to go back to work and say, 
I tried it. I was able to try it for, you know, a good number of years. I gave it all I had and it just didn't happen for me. But truly, you know, we're going to make it work one way or another. So, I like it. Kurt, if yeah. you don't mind, I'm, I want to yeah. follow up on that because I, I really would like to get both yours and Kyle's perspective on this. You know, kind of in business, I always say to be a success, you can't really have any plan B, right? Because that keeps you from diverting to the parachute. But the difference with fishing, yeah. you know, we're all addicts. And the, the <laughs> downside to that is, you know, it's, it's some point in time it's kind of like if you're addicted to gambling and you think red 13 is going to hit every time eventually there has to be an exit clause on that so you know i certainly i do not fish full time i mean you guys both know that i just i'm passionate about it and i fish as much as i can but for the two of you that are out there on that at what point in time you know kurt you being kind of the senior of the two and having more experience do you ever say okay we have to have an ejection seat button that in the event that something goes awry that i've got to have a an exit strategy. Well, so for me, I actually never had a exit strategy. It was just alterations in movement. Like, how do I keep this going? I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to stop. Are there certain instances through my 15 year career now, you know, that I've had to uh, make some adjustments and move the, the blocks around to make a picture that worked for me? No doubt, but but it was never the fact of okay, well here's my exit clause because I'm gonna stop because like I mean you said it perfectly. I hate to use this word, but we are addicts, right? I mean we want to fish. This is what we love. This is our passion. This is this is what drives us. What pushes our buttons of happiness and fulfillment. And so it's never that there was an exit strategy, but definitely there are times when you got to move the blocks to make the picture make sense because you can't go down a path of destruction, obviously. So um, that's what it's been for me. It's just moving around and making things work so that, you know, I can continue to strive for the goals that I've had since I was a teenager, you know, and I'm still knocking on the door, still waiting for, for the opening. And as far as you know, like the big win and, and, and all the things that you dream of, but, but through that process, I've been able to live what my initial goal was, and that was to make a living in the fishing industry, bass fishing. Now, it hasn't always been fishing, but it's always been associated, and always fishing has been the primary focus of the path. So, Kyle, how about you? Yeah, and I don't think I could say it much better than that, to be honest with you. I don't really have an exit strategy. I'll be honest with you, if I were to drop everything today, I could make some phone calls and probably have some work lined up before my truck ever entered back, you know, across the state of Idaho. <laughs> right, but right. truly, I mean, this is all I've ever wanted for, you know, a long time. And so I will do whatever it takes to make that happen. You know, whether, like Kurt said, make some adjustments here and there, just whatever it takes. This is, like you said, kind of my life's dream to be able to be out here fishing full time and to make a living in the industry and be able to do it day in and day out and not have to, you know, go back to a, a nine to five job somewhere else. Right, right. Well, you talk about Idaho. Let's kind of change a little focus. Let's talk some more fishing, but in a in a casting perspective, Idaho, dude, I mean, outdoors heaven, right? I mean, you know, you anything see, you could think of, right? Hunt, elk hunting, deer, mule deer, what, you know, fishing, big small mouth, largemouth fisheries. You mentioned the trout fishing out there. So let's dive into the bass fishing of Ida. What's yeah. your favorite smallie lake and your favorite way to catch them out there? Favorite smallie lake and favorite way to catch them, huh? I'd have to say I kind of consider it my home stretch river. So in the state of Idaho, I'm from the southern part of Idaho. You know, Brandon's from way up north and everyone wants to know about Brandon's lakes up there because, well, I mean, he's Brandon, but, you know, Coeur d'Alene and Pendere and all them lakes up north, they're like 12 hours from where I live. So, I mean, they're a good haul and I've never really been up there. I heard they're amazing and awesome and, you know, giant fish, but at the same time, the Southern side of the state kind of goes unnoticed and we really have, you know, a true gem in terms of smallmouth fishing and the little section of river, we call it Masker Rocks. It's kind of my home pond. It's not the closest part of the river that I could fish, but it's uh, probably the area or section that I've spent the most time on growing up and, and learning how to fish. And really the forage base on our river system 
is pretty basic. You got crawfish and you got some, some carp minnows and, and maybe some trout fingerlings at certain times of the year. But the best way to catch them for me is either stroking a tube off the bottom or throwing a crankbait in some sort of crawfish pattern. You know, reds in the spring, you know, maybe some browns as you transition and, you know, into post spawn and then, you know, just a green color in the summertime. So it, it's really hard to get away from that crawfish pattern because it just works. So cool. So river system, are you a current oriented guy? Is it like a river that has uh, some significant flow with it? And so that yeah. helps relate to other things that you see on the national tour when you've got those current type situations? Yeah. So the Snake River, I mean, it's basically a shallow current river. You know, in the spring, we get real heavy flows and then, you know, it kind of dissipates throughout the summer. But there's always current on there. You know, it never shuts on and off like we see on the Tennessee River, some of these other places, you know, that are focused around electricity. But really, just how those fish set up in the river and in the current has really helped me nationally because, you know, you can kind of relate how those smallmouth, like when we went up to Lake Erie, you know, there was current on there. It wasn't necessarily from a river system, but it was from, you know, the wind blowing around it. Those smallmouth set up pretty similar to the way my smallmouth was set up back home, you know, behind a rock pile or behind a shell bed, just trying to get out of that current and feeding the way they did. So. Well, one of the things I will tell you, Kyle, is I have got to spend a little bit of time in Idaho through our, our mutual friends at, at Megaware Keel Guard. I did some backcountry flying with Dave and Ryan Shumway and then stayed actually okay. at, at uh, Jack's place there on the Salmon River river and we went into the yeah. frank church area so uh beautiful country the wilderness of no return yes yeah well thank <laughs> thankfully i returned because i uh, we, we got into some of those places but it was it was really cool to think about that the only way to get in there was either you know by foot or you know by bush plane and uh just gorgeous country but uh i didn't see a whole lot of places in in that area to uh you know pitch to a stump to try and uh, lure a uh, a large mouth but gorgeous country yeah yeah you're more in like wolf and uh steelhead country up that direction but it is beautiful and idaho i mean it has a lot to offer like you guys said in the outdoors whether you're into hunting fishing you know snow sports it really has just about everything you could ever imagine in terms of being outdoors so um it was a great place to grow up the smallmouth fishing is great we have some good largemouth fishing there too, but I had to travel a little bit to, you know, get into the largemouth game. But it's very similar to what our smallmouth is, just current related largemouth, you know, fishing eddies and cuts and just real basic fishing. You know, nothing that we experience out here in Florida or some of these other states we go to. Very cool. All right, guys, we got to take a quick break. We're going to continue tapping into Kyle's Western Angling knowledge. Y'all stay tuned as we power pull down. Be back right after this short break. Patented in 2000, perfected over years of testing and real-world punishment, the Power Pole is the ultimate shallow water boat positioning tool. Swift, Power Pole deploys in seconds from anywhere in your boat. Virtually silent, Power Pole won't spook wary fish. Secure in strong currents or gusting winds in up to 8 feet of water. Engineered to take it with a lifetime unconditional replacement guarantee on the spike. Power Pole, swift, silent, secure. Visit PowerPole.com to find a dealer near you. Bass Edge Radio is presented in part by ProtectTheHarvest.com, returning with MLF Pro Circuit Angler Kyle Gellis in the Lucas Oil Angler Spotlight. That's right, Lucas Oil High Performance Marine Products. For oil that surpasses all manufacturers' requirements, be sure to visit the BassEdge.com store for free shipping on all Lucas products. It works. Kyle, uh, let's dive into some exceptional differences in fishing nationally versus locally from your perspective. We talked a little bit before the interview about some success you had last summer. Not only did you have a pretty decent year, Pro Circuit didn't quite make the goal you were looking for. Aaron mentioned earlier, just fell slightly short of making the championship last year with the Pro Circuit. But you won a BFL out there in Michigan which uh, pads the pocket a little bit and is always a chip in the old block. And and um, what are some of the differences that you've seen fishing on this national platform versus kind of, you know, the local territory of Ohio, you know, which was your original, obviously, perspective? Yeah, well, in Idaho, I have the one river system that I always fished. And really, I got pretty comfortable fishing it you almost felt like you had your fish named at times you know because you'd catch them so often but the difference between fishing back home in idaho to coming out here is the fact that 
everything's just on a larger scale. These lakes and rivers are so much bigger than what I'm used to at home. You know, the pools I fish at home are like one little creek in the grand scheme of a lake that we're fishing here. And so really that's kind of opened my eyes to, you know, how difficult it can be at times to find fish on the road, you know, just because everything is so much bigger than what I'm used to back home. Yeah, Kyle, you know, your story reminds me a little bit of kind of like Takahiro Omori when way back in the day in the, I think it was the 90s, early 90s when, when he came over, you know, didn't know anything, but just kind of being plunged into literally and, and figuratively of, of trying to figure out these lakes. And I think that's something that you perhaps can really relate to with Bass Edge Nation, right? Because a lot of us Absolutely. that are part of this, you know, maybe we compete, maybe we don't, but most of us just like to go out and try to figure out the bass. And so if you have limited time, right? which you do most of us are working jobs and we we get a couple days off perhaps a month to hit these new lakes but when you think about pros and cons to practicing for a lake that you have not been on what is your take on visiting a lake several days you know long before an event versus just showing up for practice a couple days prior well i think the pros are you know i'll split it up into two the pros definitely you know showing up early for an event you know say a week 10 days you're going to be able to fish more relaxed. Your practice isn't going to be rushed. You're going to probably be able to see more of the body of water that you're on and maybe get a feel for, you know, whether they're offshore, whether they're up on the bank, you know, what kind of forage is in there, what kind of grass that they're relating to. So you'll get a better idea if you, you know, are able to spend more days on there. But at that same time, if you get too dialed in too early into a practice, I feel like it can also hurt you at times because a lot of times, especially here, like I'm in Florida right now, these fish seem to change day by day. And, you know, I've seen it in other parts of the country too, whereas, you know, you could be on an awesome pattern, you know, five to 10 days out from a tournament. And then all of a sudden you get two or three days before the tournament, it just completely shuts down and you got to refigure them out, you know, and chances are they did, probably didn't move far. But if you get too dialed in too early, I feel like that could hurt you come tournament day if you don't keep an open mind on what's going on. Right. It, may, it makes a lot of sense. When I started my career, I used to go to some of these, you know, lakes and, and kind of get familiarized and, and, you know, just because you want to catch fish, you just start fishing and uh, yeah. you get a bite here and you get a bite there. Then all of a sudden when you go back for the event, you start thinking about, well, I got that bite over here and, then I, and I caught it doing this. And, and you start wanting to duplicate that because that's human nature. Yeah. You know, you had success you want, and then it can kind of potentially lead you off. I don't want to say astray, but it can take time because practice is short, especially now we've got two days yeah. of practice. So leaning on something in the past, it can be a real detriment these days. It, it can help you some. Maybe you got a rock pile or some brush piles or, or something like that where you, you know the fish are going to be utilizing here or there. Well, no Kurt, don't you think that, uh, and, and Kyle, that if we could allow our brains to only go and use it as a navigational you know, learning expedition of, okay, where things are at to get your bearings, but for some reason, I cannot leave my rods in the rod box when I do that. I always got to <laughs> right. pick up and make a cast. <laughs> That's very hard to do, but I'll be honest with you. And that's something I learned, you know, probably halfway through last season is that when I was going to a lake to pre-practice before it went off limits for a tour event, I would not make a cast. I pretty much just drove around for a day or two and just, you know, tried to find out where things were at, get oriented on the lake, see what kind of structure was out there without actually fishing. I realized it was really tough for me too. And I didn't do a very good job at it sometimes because we want to catch a fish, right? But that was one thing that I kind of learned coming into last year that I'm taking into this year is, you know, pre-practice, I don't spend a lot of time fishing unless I have a few extra days and I just want to catch some fish. But I just pretty much drive around, idle, you know, and just get a feel for the lake, what's out there. And then that way, hopefully you're fresh when you come into your two days of practice for an event. Yeah, I think it's real important. And I think guys fishing weekend events or or just, you know, out there fishing on the weekend, relying on what you saw last week or two weeks prior or three weeks prior, it can really take a hit on your time on the water. So, you know, important Bass Edge Nation to, to keep in mind, to keep things fresh. Go with current daily conditions, sunny, cloudy, water temps, all those kinds of things that, you know, lean on the fundamentals that we learn here through Bass Edge Radio and and all the books and and other information that's out there through bass fishing. But lean on those fundamentals, but still keep an open mind throughout the day. And uh, that's the reason why we all have eight or ten rods or, or 15 rods rigged up 
when we first hit the water and hope to narrow it down to, you know, four or five by the end of a few days. But uh, yeah, great stuff there, Kyle. You know, we haven't had this discussion on the show in, in quite a while. And you're in a great position after now you've had a full year of national tour experience. You've got off to a great start this year with the uh, MLF Pro Circuit with a good finish there at Lake Okeechobee. Now getting ready to hit Smith Lake, a little bit different here in Alabama. But a lot of anglers are wanting to live this dream, this passion that we talked about in the first half of the interview. From your experience this year and last year, what does an angler need to be ready for to make that jump to the national tournament fishing level and have a good opportunity to be successful? What are your key ingredients? Well, I think the biggest thing I learned coming out here, you know, when I first took off for home, you kind of look at these guys that you've looked up to for a good number of years that have been on tour or the elite series for quite some time. And you kind of study on how they came about, you know, getting there and that type of stuff. And you try to make a plan for yourself around that. But really what I learned is I think everyone's path to getting here is going to be different based on, you know, your life circumstances. And so I would say one of the most important things, if you're going to make that plunge, figure out a plan that's going to work for you. If you got family, you know, set up some kind of system that, you know, you guys are going to continue to communicate around your fishing or, you know, still get that important time together somehow, whether it's through FaceTime or being home at certain times. Just try to plan out as much of that as you can so that all the variables are taken care of when you're out here on the road. So all you can do is focus on fishing is the biggest thing I've learned is try to have everything mapped out as best you can. And it's going to be your own individual map, right? Like I said, it's not going to be someone else's map because it may not necessarily work for you or for them. So um, try to figure out all your home life stuff so you can focus on fishing. And then biggest thing I learned also is you got to fail fast. I mean, I had so many events last year where I just absolutely failed and you got to try to learn from them and then forget about them by the time you get to the next one. Because if you have them in the back of your mind all the time, you're going to get down on yourself and you're going to start losing confidence and you're just not going to fish well at the next one. So try to learn quick from your mistakes and, and move on and figure out how to catch them at the next one. That's a mouthful right there. And that's great. Not only fishing advice, that's great life advice. Kyle, before we head to uh, the listener question segment, I've, I've got to slip another question in here. And, and I just want to warn you, it's not a trick question and there's no you know answer particularly that I'm looking for. But I've got to know, what is your favorite MegaWare product and why? Yeah, you guys would have to ask that, huh? <laughs> just, joined, just joined Kurt on the MegaWare team and couldn't, and couldn't be happier. You know, it's been an awesome experience so far, and hopefully we continue down the road with them. I think the most obvious product would be, you know, the Keel Guard. I think it put them on the map. And if you don't have one on your boat, I think you're crazy just because it's something I use every day. Because a lot of times, Kirk can probably attest to this, we're launching our boats by ourselves most of the time, and there's usually not a day that I don't beach it up on the shoreline, on a boat ramp, or, you know, wherever it may be so I can go park the truck. But I would say the one I'm most excited about this year, because I've had that one on my boat for the past three boats, I think, so I've always had a MegaWare keel guard on there. But the one that I got new this year is the Flex Step Pro. And the reason why I like it, I didn't stick it on the side trailer to gain access into my boat like it was intended for. But this year, I upgraded to a truck camper. And it's a little smaller truck camper, so it has the door in the back where you would step out. And then a lot of times, you're stepping on your trailer. And my trailer beam is real slick, so I kind of put it in a sneaky spot, that Flex Step Pro, where it's just pretty much a nice, smooth step for me to step right out of my truck camper when it's hooked up to the boat. And I don't have to worry about tripping or falling. And... I mean, it's something I use every day. It's been awesome. Kurt, Kurt, my, Kurt likes that one too, and, and he uses that one quite often to uh, to get in and out of bed. So um, anyway. <laughs> Get in, in and out of bed? Well, I haven't put it in my bed yet. You know, I may have to use that in a few years once I start getting sore, I guess. <laughs> nice. Yeah, MegaWare, you know, a lot of underrated, I would say, products that they provide and a lot of ways to use the stuff, man. That's a great example of another method of the MegaWare madness that uh, can help in all kinds of scenarios, man. That's great stuff. Love for you sharing that. And uh, let's jump into our listener question. This portion of the episode presented by Nitro Performance Bass Boats. We've got a question in from Terry Evans. He asks, 
For amateurs who love fishing and feel they have the skill to compete in big tournaments, what does the route look like from the weekend angler to being on the Elite Series, MLF, or professional scene? No better person to answer this question than you, Kyle. I think that's a great question by Terry. And I think it's going to depend on where you're at in your life. If you're a young individual, you know, say, getting out of high school, looking at going into college, you're crazy if you don't take an opportunity to go to college somewhere with a fishing team because that's just going to expose you to competing, you know, in different parts of the country. It's going to expose you to the networking that's out there. You know, some of the sponsors, you're going to get introductions there. You're just going to meet the people in the industry. If it's something you want to do, you know, you're just going to have all that information available to you to making that leap from, you know, say the college level onto a national circuit, whether it's the elites or the MLF or what, whatever you're striving for. If you're a little past the college, like I am at this point, I would say, you know, there's many opportunities out there. Um, start at your club level. Cause some of those, to be honest with you, are probably the most competitive out there. You know, you got some guys out there that don't make a living fishing, but they could probably do it if they truly wanted to. But start there, you know, and work your way up into the BFLs or the Toyota series. One piece of advice that I learned when I was doing it, you know, I kind of cherry picked the tournaments that I wanted to fish, whether it was around my college schedule or work schedule, but I feel like I didn't get the full picture of a fishing season, right? And so I would say if you're striving to move on to the pro circuit or the elite, you got to try to fish a full qualifier season. That way you'll get kind of a full, you know, you'll, you'll learn how to catch them in pre-spawn. You'll learn how to catch them post-spawn, maybe summertime, just depends on when those you know, events are held, but that's one thing I would do. Pick a BFL circuit or a Toyota circuit and just try to fish the full one that you possibly can. You'll get a lot more experience that way than if you just tried to cherry pick them when you wanted to fish them at times. Uh, great answer there. Uh, and Kyle, thank you for helping Terry with that question. Terry, uh, simply need you to log on to BassEdge.com, click the Claim Your Prize tab, fill out the information, and we are going to send the Bass Edge gift directly to your doorstep. As a reminder to Bass Edge listeners, keep sending in those questions through our Instagram or Facebook media page. Also, you can shoot us an email, support at BassEdge.com to maybe have your question chosen to be answered on the next episode and win a free gift from Bass Edge Radio. Well, Kyle, it was uh, certainly a pleasure having you on Bass Edge Radio, kind of talking to Bass Edge Nation. You know, I look forward to uh, including you in the uh, group text um, and, and getting the scoop on, on some of the, the Megaware crew. And we like to sling stories and, and have fun with that. But uh, in the meantime, very uh, interesting and informative interview. But before we let you go, any final thoughts uh, for Bass Edge Nation. Oh, not really. I just appreciate you guys having me on. This is my first ever podcast, in case you haven't noticed. So, I mean, it's been a fun experience talking with you guys, and um, hopefully there's more to come in the future. Yeah, I think there definitely is, Kyle. You knocked it out of the park, man. It was great to have you on the show. Really pleasure just getting to know you better, man. So, uh, look forward to seeing you more out on the road and on the water at the MLF Pro Circuit events this year. And, uh, man, until I see you again, take care, safe travels. Y'all stay tuned. Bass Edge Radio, we're returning after this short break. You know the importance of protecting your investments, so why use anything else other than the original and toughest DIY keel protector for your boat, MegaWare Keel Guard. Grinding sand, abrasive rocks, and concrete ramps are no match for our exclusive contoured edge and patented technology. MegaWare Keel Guard keel protectors are made tough and made to stick. Their do-it-yourself installation takes less than an hour, providing the longest-lasting, most dependable keel protection for your boat, guaranteed for life. Developed specifically by boat builders, offering the best keel protection in the industry. Also for MegaWare Keel Guard, Skeg Guard, Flex Step Pro, and Pontoon Guard. So give your boat the performance edge. Put on the protection the pros pick. MegaWare Keel Guard. Patented in 2000, perfected over years of testing and real-world punishment, the Power Pole is the ultimate shallow water boat positioning tool. Swift, Power Pole deploys in seconds from anywhere in your boat. Virtually silent, Power Pole won't spook wary fish. Secure in strong current or gusting winds in up to 8 feet of water. Engineered to take it with a lifetime unconditional replacement guarantee on the spike. Power Pole, swift, silent, secure. Visit PowerPole.com to find a dealer near you. 
Be at home with nature with nature-inspired art, decor, and gifts by Wild Wings at wildwings.com. Explore art prints and canvas wraps of bass, trout, walleye, muskie, and more by acclaimed artists like Mark Sassino. I primarily paint underwater scenes of game fish and usually in a fishing situation, going after prey or going after a lure or a fly. I get asked sometimes whether I like fishing better or artwork. It would be tough to give either of them up. I can't really think of a good reason to give either up, so I'm going to stick with them. Make your home, office, or cabin show off your passion for angling. Visit wildwings.com backslash Bass Edge and sign up for an exclusive offer to Bass Edge listeners of 10% off your next order. Give something special to your loved one and be at home with nature. Visit wildwings.com backslash Bass Edge. That's wildwings.com backslash Bass Edge to get 10% off your next order of nature-inspired art, decor, and gifts by Wild Wings. Kyle's interview, uh, certainly a good one. Uh, you know, one of the things that sticks out to me, Kurt, is, you know, the sport, the career of bass fishing is a tough one, but I got to believe, and, and you can relate a little bit to this being from Del Rio, but being from Idaho, he said he hasn't been home in forever and likely not to get back until October. Um, right. That adds a different layer, you know, to the challenge. It does. It's been a while, Aaron, since we've had a little bit of a lifestyle interview, right? Yeah, I mean, that's accurate. Um, yeah. Yeah, kind of a way to peek inside the behind the scenes view of an angler that's making that step, you know, and has had a little bit of experience over the last 12, 14 months and uh, is doing it fairly successfully. Kyle's catching them. Don't be misconstrued. A guy that comes from Idaho running around, dude's catching them. You can tell by the interview. Right. I mean, he's got it twisted on correctly. Right. There's not a whole lot of loose screws going on. In that yeah. Area. I mean, you, you, I, I don't think you could be more accurate because, I mean, let's be for real here. After 348 episodes, I mean, obviously you and I have a few of these under our belt and just right. how he carries himself and how he answers. And for that to you know be his first ever interview, which when <laughs> yeah. you get into the sport, you know, the communication piece and, and being able to articulate, you know, he's very, very well-rounded. He is. So it was great having him on the show and uh, love getting that again behind the scenes backstage, hopefully for a lot of our you know listeners that are you know interested in, in that kind of thing, even though today wasn't widely great on educational fishing format. It was definitely hugely educational on how the process evolves into the game of fishing on the national level. And uh, hopefully, uh, as Kyle mentioned, you know, everybody's path's going to be a little bit different, but, you know, everybody's got a path or a potential path to try to follow and uh, you just got to wind and weave through that trail that you blaze and uh, hopefully you're the next guest on Bass Edge Radio that we talk to about how you made it to the national level if that is so your desire. Yeah, very true and you know concerning paths to follow I think we need to be following the path out the door um, because <laughs> this episode is a wrap Kurt as always great hanging out with you and, and talking about uh, the sport of bass fishing but uh, until next time which will be April 1st just right around the corner episode 349 looking forward to seeing who you have in store for us in the meantime be sure to stay up on all things bass edge and that is through our social media platforms and certainly bassedge.com for kurt dove i am aaron martin we look forward to joining you april 1st for episode 349 so long everybody the edge is presented by megaware keel guard for more information on bass edge or to shop at the bass edge online store visit bassedge.com and be sure to join kurt dove and aaron martin right here on another episode of the edge brought to you in part by nitro boats Lucas Oil, ProtectTheHarvest.com, Mercury Marine, PowerPole, and Rapaholic.com.